There is more love somewhere. There is more love somewhere. I'm going to keep on till I find it. There is more love somewhere. There is more peace somewhere. There is more peace somewhere. I'm going to keep on till I find it. There is more peace somewhere. There is more joy somewhere. There is more joy somewhere. I'm going to keep on till I find it. There is more joy somewhere. There is justice somewhere. There is justice somewhere. I'm going to keep on till I find it. There is justice somewhere. There is more love somewhere. There is more love somewhere. I'm going to keep on till I find it. There is more love somewhere. Good evening. This is our prelude music. We hope you're tuning in. Feel free to let us know that you're out there, okay? This land is your land. This land is my land. From California to the New York Island. From the Redwood Forest Gulf Stream waters. This land is made for you and me. As I was walking that ribbon of highway, I saw above me that endless skyway. I saw below me that golden valley. This land was made. This land is your land, this land is my land, from California to the New York Island, from the Redwood Forest to the Gulf Street Water. This land was made for you and me. I roamed and rambled and followed my footsteps of sparkling sands of her diamond deserts and all around me a voice was sounding this land was made for you and me sing it with us would you this land is yours this land is mine from california This land was made for you and me When the sun came shining Then I was strolling In wheat fields waving And dust clouds rolling The voice was chanting As the fog was lifting This land was made for you and me
This land was made for you and me. That song goes back decades before Earth Day ever began, but it's as appropriate as it could possibly be for the understanding that this land, this world belongs to God. And we answer to God when we answer to this land, this world, this creation comes from the Most High God. And we give blessings and thanks for that. And yes, the Bible reinforces that we have been given stewardship over this land. It's up to us. We're in a position to destroy it or to save it and grow it together, no matter what comes along. So God bless this world. May we continue to be good stewards. Welcome everybody to Friday night. It's seven o'clock on a Friday night and we'd like to welcome you to our short service. And we'd like to, all, we'd like to pay particular attention to Wayside Christian Mission and Maddie's house. We've had a chance to interface with you guys over the past couple of weeks and celebrate the love that God brings us together with in these hard times. We love you. And we know you're there in our hearts the same way we're there in yours. We invite you to send in your requests so that at the end of the service, we can share them with each other. Jim England's here with us tonight and uh, he'll be able to read some of those. So send them in, get online, get your friends online, go to Facebook for the, the Highland Baptist Church page and uh, send us in those prayer requests, would you please? We'd love to have you join us. Um, special guest tonight, Daryl Adams. We're so glad that he's here and uh, he's gonna help us all the way through the service with a bunch of things. And you know when we meet in person, when we used to and when we will again, this is the time when we ask for everybody to turn their cell phones off, except now. We want you to leave your cell phones on. We want you to stay on so that on Facebook you can send us your prayer requests and let us know how you're doing, okay? Um, we're going to start this evening with a testimony in Scripture. This is the fourth Friday of the month, and so this is for Friday Church. This is what we call our testimony week. So Daryl's going to sing you a beautiful song in a moment that he wrote and that I know you're going to enjoy. But in the meantime, we're going to start this service with um, sections from Psalm 116. I'll read the first, and Marty will read the second, and Daryl will read the third. So if you have a Bible, or um, if you can reach around and get one, go ahead and open it to Psalm 116. Psalm 116. We're going to read the Message Translation, which is wonderful. That's the Message Bible that so many of you have. And um, when we get back in business, we'll have more of them for you. We'd love to have you have that with you, okay? So let's start out from Psalm 116. It goes like this. I love that God listened to me, listened as I begged for mercy. God listened so intently as I laid out my case. Death stared me in the face. Hell was hard on my heels. Up against it, I didn't know which way to turn. Then I called out to God for help. Please, God, I cried out. Save my life. Now I know God takes the side of the helpless. When I was at the end of my rope, God saved me. I said to myself, relax and rest. God has showered you with blessings, soul, You've been rescued from death. I, you've been rescued from tears. And you, foot, were kept from stumbling. I'm striding in the presence of God, alive in the land of the living. I stayed faithful, though bedeviled. And despite a ton of bad luck, despite giving up on the human race, saying, they're all liars and cheats. What can I give back to God for the blessings poured out on me? I'll lift high the cup of salvation, a toast to God. I'll pray in the name of God. 
I'll complete what I promised God I'll do. I'll do it together with his people. When they arrive at the gates of death, God welcomes them. O oh God, here I am, your servant, your faithful servant. At me free for your service. Comes now a time of prayer. We're going to do a response. We'll just do it within the church. And we invite you to go in a prayerful state and join us. I'm going to ask Marty to come up, and Marty and Daryl will do our response, and I'll do the um, what we call in church, of course, the light print. So this is a prayer of confession. That also, the words from this we share with the uh, Sunday service of Highland. So we have a continuity there, and we invite you to go online. Uh, it's 10 o'clock on Sunday morning, and, and join the, uh, the Sunday morning service here at Highland. So let's pray together, shall we? I'll start things out with this. 
Gracious God, forgive us for the times when we assume our spiritual growth is complete. Forgive us in the room of the authentic world around us. Let's have you guys do that, if you would, please. I'm in your copy, oh, I'm sorry. Aha. Uh -huh. There we go. We'll start that again. Gracious God, forgive us for the times when we assume our spiritual growth is complete. Forgive, forgive us when we presume our will tames the world around us. Renew our baptism this Easter tide. Remind us that forgiveness and the Holy Spirit are ours to claim as new every morning. In the baptismal waters, we give our lives joyfully to the God who listens, renews, and grants us rest. Through the mystery of Christ's resurrection, we know ourselves to be forever yours. Let that be enough. Let's pray in silence for a moment. Hear now these words of assurance taken from 1 Peter, the first chapter. As you set yourselves apart by your obedience to the truth, so that you might have genuine affection for your fellow believers, love each other deeply and earnestly. You have been given new birth from seed that does not decay. This seed is God's life-giving and enduring word. What, what a fellowship, what a joy divine, leaning on the everlasting arms. What a blessedness, what a peace is mine, leaning on the everlasting arms. Lee. 
Our gospel lesson tonight is from the 24th chapter of Luke, beginning at verse 13 and on to 35. Now on that same day, two of them were on the way to Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, what are you discussing with each other while you walk along? They stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place there in these days? He asked them, What things? They replied, The things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, this is now the third day since these things took place, and some women from our group astounded us. They were at the tomb early this morning, and when they did not find his body there, they came back and told us they had indeed seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see him. Then he said to them, Oh, how foolish you are, and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself in all the scriptures. As they came near the village to which they were going, he walked ahead as if he were going on. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, because it's almost evening, and the day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. And when he was at table with them, he took bread, blessed, and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him. And he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, Were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us? That same hour they got up and returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven and their companions gathered together. They were saying, The Lord has risen indeed, and has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road, and how he had been made known to them in the breaking of bread. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. It starts out on that same day, but... You know, we think of Easter as a nice sunrise service and brightly new, bright new clothes and flowers and banners and music and seeing each other. For them, that same day meant a day that started in darkness and confusion and grief and fear. And we pick up with two of them, not from the inner group, but two of them walking away to Emmaus. I picture them shuffling along in misery and sadness. Just go somewhere, just somewhere else. But geography has never cured grief. And Emmaus, Emmaus is nowhere. We can't find it on a map, we can't find it in history. It's nowhere, unless it was your somewhere, where you grew up, where you had parents, and siblings, where you loved, where you had friends, where you learned, then it was somewhere. And Cleopas is the one who's identified here, but this is the only place he's identified, then he disappears altogether. He's not one of the close inner circle, he, and there's an unnamed person, Apparently, the gospel writer didn't think enough of that person to even mention the name. Some suggest his wife, but we don't know that. So there are two people who historically, scripturally, don't seem to have much consequence. And Jesus joins them and says he comes near, but they're kept from recognizing him. It suggests that this is divine work. But I have to ask myself, what keeps me from recognizing the holy in my midst, 
the sacred when it arrives. I think about distraction, things that keep me looking all kinds of places except at what I need to see. During this pandemic time, I'm still running and it's, um, it's always interesting to me because occasionally I see this young man somewhere between the ages of 22 to 28. He's always walking a dog and he always has his head in a phone. I have passed within 10 or 12 feet of him at least 30 times and he has never ever seen me. He is fully distracted. If he were to come in right now and we'd have to be introduced, he would have to say honestly he's never seen me. He is distracted and missing what's all around him really. What keeps me from recognizing the holy distraction? But it's also distress. Grief, pain, fear, shame. You start carrying that load around and you're bent over and you never do look up for eye contact. Or maybe it's distrust that keeps us from noticing the sacred. It's one thing, an awful thing really, to be betrayed by your first gods, parents who abuse, or abandon, leaving us with a sense that we cannot trust the world. Or a teacher, I know from years ago, spending a lot of time with an individual, a teacher who sexually exploited the child for two years, and it deeply damaged her ability to even have faith. All kinds of things keep us from recognizing God. Jesus asked about their conversation. He sort of invites himself into it. And they stood still looking sad. I mean, how do you put into words to someone who's a stranger to you the brutality that you have witnessed, what it did to you inside when you really believe that this is the guy who is going to lead you, when you genuinely love this person and you lost them in such traumatic fashion? How do you, how do you put that into words? How do people coming back from war zones ever talk about the monstrosity of war that they've seen? How will those on the front lines of the battle with this pandemic come back and talk about what they've seen? They stood still, looking sad. And they tell their story, and it concludes with, but we had hoped that this was the Messiah, the one to redeem Israel. And unspoken is, he was our vision for life. He was our hero. We had hoped. Sad words. Because they'd also seen themselves as champions. We had hoped we'd be better than this. We had hoped we'd be more courageous than this. But I've heard that phrase in a hundred ways over my life. I had hoped that we had beaten the cancer. I had hoped that I had more time. I had hoped someone would love me. I had hoped I would make the team. I had hoped I'd get the scholarship and could go to school. I had hoped, and it's past tense. But Jesus picks up there and reinterprets the story. His whole ministry has been about trying to define what the Messiah is about, not their, not their champion with a sword on a war horse, but the one who comes alongside of them and literally acts that out with them now on this road. He is with them in their grief and in their despair. It says something to me that all the little known Cleopases in the world, Jesus is there. And all the unknown little places in the world that we don't count to be anything, Jesus is there. They get where they're going. Jesus acts like he's going further, but they beg him to stay with them. In that culture, one of the highest values was hospitality. 
There was no Motel 6 leaving the light on for anybody. If you were just left on the open road, you were in danger of robbers, much less being cold or lonely, and you always invited somebody with you if you practiced the highest of your culture. And so they asked him to stay, which seems to me, in the worst of times for them, they did the best they knew. And I think that's important. I think about Friday Church here, and we, we miss you. For me, this is the worst of the time we've had in the, the two years plus that I've been with you. But the Friday Church ministry group learned about a need for food and need for educational materials, and they jumped in and did that just practically in a heartbeat. They did the best they could in the worst of times. And that actually acts out faith, that what we do matters. In their grief and despair, they still had faith. And of all of our displacement with this pandemic, we still have faith that what we do matters. It also set them up for discovery because there at the table, when the simple gesture of breaking bread and handing it to them, they recognized him. A moment of recognition, and they know. You ever have one of those moments when somehow the puzzle pieces fall into place and you get it? They got it. Seven miles is a long way to walk. And as it's getting dark, they scramble back to Jerusalem for seven more miles over ground that will be much more dangerous now. But they go. I suspect their pace is a lot faster because now they realize what matters. They realize they matter. May we, in our encounter with the risen Lord, know that we matter. Amen. Jeff's going to bring me the prayer request. I request that we pray for all of our folks in recovery, that you might have a sense of presence and peace. We pray that for son Nathan, who's been exposed a second time on the job, has to self-quarantine again for 14 days. Pray that he's still negative. We pray for those who are giving up hope. May God wrap his arms around them. And prayers for our elected officials. Prayers for wisdom as they make decisions that affect our daily lives. And as often as you say when you write the prayers when you're actually here physically in the building, you pray for those who are still in the madness. We do that as we pray for all of you. Would you bow with me, please, in prayer? For these things, O Lord, for leaders and the difficulty of decision-making, for Nathan, that he may be negative still. For those who feel more despair than hope. For all our folks in recovery. May we know that what we do matters. May we know that we matter. Hold on to us, even as we struggle to hold on to you. In the name of the risen Lord. Amen.